Hello world, hello internet, and welcome to the sixth episode of the 2023 Nix Developer Dialogues. I am Valentin, your host. My host name is Frickler Handwerk, and this show is about people making the Nix ecosystem. We call it an ecosystem for a reason. It is diverse and large, and you don't have to work on something that is branded with the official Nix logo to have an impact and be an important part of the community. And this is true for our two guests today. And before we meet them, let me remind you that you can send all your comments and questions into any of the channels you're watching this from. We also have a matrix room, which is linked in the calendar event for this show. And in the same calendar event, there's a link to the studio, which you can join to become part of the show, ask your questions, discuss in person. I would love to have you here. And now welcome Vincent Ambo, known as Tazjan, and Florian Klink, known as Flokli. Hello. Hey. Hi. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for taking time. Today we will talk about Twix. What's up with Twix? What's, what is it even? And uh, what are the news about it? Um, let me introduce you briefly. Uh, so you are both part of a group which calls itself The Virus Lounge, TVL. And within the Nix community, you're most well known for rewriting Nix in Rust. Um, Vincent, you've since 2020, you've been working on a re-implementation of the Nix language evaluator. And Florian, you uh, recently uh, showed some progress on a store implementation, the thing below, the layer below the Nix language on top of which the ecosystem is built. And I think it's not the first one. And we will talk um, about that in more detail and a lot more things. But before we get into that, let's um, introduce you a little bit. Talk, tell us more about yourself. Um, who of you got into Nix first? Who started Nixing first and why? Um, I think we probably started around the same time, somewhere in 2017, 2018. We didn't know each other at the time, so I can't speak precisely for what yeah. uh, happened to Florian at the time. But I lived in Oslo at the time in Norway, and I watched a talk about Nix um, by, I think, Rock uh, Garbus, who is still active in the Nix ecosystem. And in the beginning, it didn't really click. Like, I wasn't sure what to do with this thing until eventually something just got into me. I installed NixOS, and everybody knows how the path develops on from there. Um, so yeah, around around that time. What about you, Florian? Yeah, same, like uh, 20, I think 2016 at Congress, Case Communication Congress, I, I sat down together with Andy, who's been trying out this Nix thing. and. Uh, also didn't really click, and then like a bunch of months later, uh, I yeah I also installed it on my computer. I was like, okay, I'm not going to be able to do any work for the next two days, and uh, and yeah, I started packaging everything that left and right, and uh, yeah, that's that's how it started. I would say. And today you're still mixing hard. So what kept you in the around? What kept you around? Why did you stick? Well, for me, I think um, at some point the concept of Nix really clicked. Um, for me, there's this 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 feeling that I'm manipulating the entire config of everything I care about as one big data structure, and there's not really any other tool that lets me do that. So I think there's an in that you have with Nix, which is either something like you install Nix on another system and like use it to summon some developer tooling from the void, or you install Nix and then like managing configuration of that machine. But once I really understood the power of what I can do there, like override small lines of code in some dependency of a dependency, like basically trivially, I was completely hooked. And uh, I still don't know any other systems that come close to this, um, other than like extremely large, complicated proprietary monorepo setups and so on. So it's, for me, it's really without any alternatives right now, I would say. Thanks, Florian. What about you? Yeah, I mean the the tooling, uh, the tooling of course is uh, is like a bit was a bit hard to get uh, to get into initially. Like the the user experience is very very like brutal. Um, uh, so yeah, I, we ran into into our heads at some point. But but yeah, once you once you get the hang to it, once you understand that oh this this nice packages thing and all these package expressions actually just function that I call. And uh, that was the point where it clicked for me. Um, understanding the module system took a while longer. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, the power the power of being able to override things, being able to carry a certain fix onto your local thing that you use to describe all your machines and the entirety of your system configuration. Um, and shipping that patch before it gets up. Uh, gets uh, accepted upstream is, is one of the, the big, big strengths. Um, I try to like 
get some fixes into Debian in some package there to be able to use it on a on a host of like on a fleet of of Puppet managed hosts and like if you're not a Debian developer you cannot uh, you cannot get this stuff done at all or at least not without considerable effort and here it's just like oh you drop this snippet somewhere here in this overwrite and everything that uses this also now puts in this batch yeah um so as as I said in the beginning you were part of TVL what is TVL where where did it come from all right, there's a bit of background story here. Um, so basically in 2020, there was a worldwide event uh, known to everyone, I suppose, which is where TVL, uh, which expands to the virus launch, got its name from. Um, basically in the beginning of the year, when various governments decided to do lockdowns and so on, there were a lot of people that are normally very social, like go to tech meetups, meet up with people and so on, that kind of got stranded and wanted a place to socialize. I was one of those people. and. Um, what initially happened is that I just literally on Twitter posted a link to a Google Meet video chat. I was like, hey, if you're like interested in tech and you want to chat, just hop into this chat. And it, it kind of took on a life of its own where in the beginning, like for the first couple of days, we had only a handful of people jump in, like right when I posted the link. But then very quickly, it turned into this like 24 hour community where we always kept this video chat running. And like people were coming and going and we actually started writing automation tooling uh, to try and keep the video chat going when google was closing it because nobody was in the chat so that the link would stay active all sorts of stuff like this and um, a lot of the people joining the chat at the time i was working at google were also colleagues from google who were interested in monorepo tooling and we were like hey why don't we try um, making an open source monorepo using publicly available tooling and hey there's this thing called nix we think it fits very well into this niche it's see what we can do with it. And then it just kind of developed on from there. And many of the people that are active in TVL today are still the core people uh, from the original video chat. So that's quite cool. So in Floki, you joined that as well at some point? Yeah, I, I don't know entirely if I, if I saw the link or if it, like me and Vincent, we, we had some, some connection before that already. I'm not entirely sure if it was because of the meet link or just because you said like, oh, I have this meet link here, you want to join. But yeah, I kind of also participated in some of these, uh, these uh, well, in this meeting, but but like uh, in some hours, some evenings. I'm um, looking at the yeah. graph on our website. We have a big graph that shows all the people that are members of TVL and where they came from, like how they ended up there. And you have a link through Nix. So I think we got you hooked through the Nix community somehow. Yeah. So what is TVL today? I know you have an IRC room, which is Bridge to Matrix. Uh, is that where things happen these days? Yeah, I think most of the communication now is uh, basically in the IRC channel. The IRC channel is the canonical channel, but we do Bridge to Matrix because that's quite popular in the Nix community. There's a lot of people that are in the official channels and makes it easy for them to join. Um, although if you do join the TVL channel through Matrix, please don't edit your messages in Matrix. That's very annoying for ISC users. Um, and we still have usernames that are like uh, 50 characters long. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but we still do occasionally host video chats, but it's mostly topic focused things. So it's like, let's say that Florian and I are working on some specific part of Twix and we want to get some feedback from other people involved in the project, like uh, Sterni, Adam Joseph, and so on. We will post a link to a video chat and it'll usually be open. So anyone who's in the channel can join. Um, but this has been happening relatively less frequently in recent times. Uh, so it's definitely more text-based now than it was in the beginning. Um, yeah, we do have a whole bunch of stuff. So Twix is only one of our projects. Um, we have a website, tvl.fyi. I think the link will be somewhere in the description. Um, and uh, that's where you find all of our publicly available tooling, like CI integration for Nix, our monorepo, all the monorepo related tooling, various random projects, some of which we might talk about later on, and all of that good stuff. So essentially, it's a community oriented around open source monorepo design, open source monorepo tooling. Um, what? So you already said this has something to do with Nix because Nix allows managing that at some scale, um, but. How did you come into rewriting Nix? How how did Twix evolve? I mean, yeah, why didn't you just use it as it was? This it's hard to say where to start exactly. Um, so I think I should maybe add some background on why we chose Nix in the first place. 
Um, so if you look at large companies using monorepos, what's nice about them is that they have very homogenous workflows. Like you can easily move between projects. Everything is clearly understood. CI works the same way everywhere. It's quite nice. Um, but if you look at the large companies using monorepo workflows, like Google, Yandex, and so on, um, they usually have much larger amounts of manpower available, of course, in a small open source project. So if they want to take a third party dependency, they want to use some Rust library, some C++ library, whatever, they usually have the manpower to literally repackage that thing into their internal build system and like build it granularly on the level as all of their other code. Um, that doesn't really work for an open source project with like 10 active contributors. Like imagine every single Rust library or whatever that you want to use has to be manually repackaged by you in order to work it on. You can't use any external build system. Um, but Nix already exists and has a large ecosystem of uh, pre-packaged packages and also has pretty good integration with various other build systems, which means that Nix kind of acts like a sort of glue, you could say. Um, I have this phrase for it, which I call a distributed monorepo. You can have a monorepo with all of your source code and use Nix to very exactly pin all the uh, external inputs that you have and make them reproducibly available as if they were part of your repository itself. There's not really any other tool that I'm aware of that lets you do this. So we kind of just ended up on Nix and uh, well, stuck to it. Um, okay, well, and now Twix, where does that come into, into the place? So um, we were trying to write a bunch of tooling uh, to, this was the original cause, uh, to build software on the same level of abstraction as you would in Bazel, for example. I don't know if people are familiar with Bazel. It's an open source build system. Um, and in Bazel, if you're building, let's say, a program written in Go, uh, you at some point invoke a Bazel rule that says something like go program and you literally list all of your source files like main.go, blah, 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 go and so on. And it produces the binary when you execute that build rule. In Nix, we usually have a slightly higher level of abstraction, right? So if you're building a go program, for example, in Nix, you're usually invoking the actual go build system and that's taking care of all the uh, underlying stuff like picking the source files and assembling them, calling the linker and so on. Um, and we were experimenting with what happens if we write this level of abstraction in Nix. So we have actual Nix code that looks like Bazel code, for example. You say something like nix.buildgo.program, um, and then you call it with a list of your source files and it assembles it into a program for you. Turns out that actually works pretty well in Nix with the exception of performance. Um, the amount of derivations, which is the fundamental kind of unit of computation, if you will, in Nix, uh, that you get if you write all of your software this way is is basically orders of magnitude larger than what you get if you package uh, ready-made build systems and just call them inside of your Nix build. And uh, also, in order to make this kind of smooth to use, especially with third-party dependencies, you want to use import from derivations. So you want to generate Nix code in derivations and re-import it into your build tree. Um, and that's not very well supported in the current uh, implementation of Nix. It works, but there's some issues with things like phase separation and performance. Uh, that makes this a very like slow and serial process uh, right now. So we initially decided to uh, try and improve the code base of, of Nix as is, the C++ code base. And there was actually a multi-month project, which you can still find somewhere in our Git history. We were slowly chopping away at some of the complexity in the code base. Um, Nix started out as an academic project. You probably covered this in one of the previous episodes. I'm assuming people are familiar with it. And the code, I think the project it's one of those projects that became more successful than was originally anticipated. Um, and as a result of that, there's been a lot of code growth. There's like multiple different implementations in the code base of how to open and read a file um, and things like that. Uh, so as a result, we found it quite difficult to make large scale changes in the code base that brought us closer to the kind of world that we wanted to live in, in regards to Nix performance and the general architecture of the system. And then at some point we just decided what if we do a clean slate implementation of this, figure out what are the core concepts and like do it on our own. Uh, okay, um, Floakly, you're working on one of these core concepts, the store. Uh, what, so what is Twix? What is What makes it different from the C++ Nix implementation? Mm, I would say it, it started by, by looking, like we had the luxury of looking at uh, the existing code base and the existing concepts and set up, okay, let's, Let's. Uh, well, we could we could do some history about this. Like we were in a in a 
in an apartment in Hogada in Egypt on a lovely whiteboard. And we were like whiteboarding uh, the different components of Nix if we were to uh, re-architect them. And uh, we were not very happy about the, the interfaces between the different components and the pluggability of the different components. What so are we, these um, specifically? In uh, like in Nix, we we kind of uh, try to uh, decom like like uh, decompose them into like you have something that understands Nix the language, and uh, you have something that stores um, store paths or like the contents inside these store paths, and uh, and something that takes care of um, somewhat consuming some build recipes and producing them and importing like putting them into the store, and then we wanted to have like a properly defined. Uh, um, RPC style interface between these different components um, that could be where you can plug your own implementation um, if you uh, and, and you're not necessarily required to use the same language. You're not necessarily required to have it live in the same process. It could cross hosts easily. And some of the, the different concepts would be, um, yeah, because it's a native natively an RPC based protocol, it would be easier to just like, oh, okay, I can also run this somewhere else, I can actually kind of start to um, load balance proxy style uh, certain requests to here and certain requests to there, do some filtering and all these kind of manipulations. Uh, yeah, and I'm I'm working on the store. Until now, something like the, like the store itself has been further decomposed into subcomponents. Like we have like the whole content address part of uh, uh, nature of the store, like the, the different items inside the, um, inside the store path are like now split into a Twix CA store component, whereas the the thing that says like, oh, these contents here live at this next store path with this name uh, live in, the, in another crate. Um, but yeah, essentially the idea was to get a bird's eye view on the, on the, whole, um, on the whole problem, on the whole uh, ecosystem and uh, try to split it into different components and have nicely defined interfaces between them um, to make it easily pluggable and testable. Okay, Maybe. Before, we continue, sorry, before we continue, brief reminder to our live audience, send your questions and comments. So this is, as you see, is gonna be a very deeply technical talk today. Uh, slow us down if we go too fast. I'll um, try to ask questions like, what are you talking about? What is it that you're actually describing? Be concrete. But um, we may miss something, so please ask questions. That will be great to have you as an audience and uh, have you involved in the show. Um, yes, please, uh, Tazrin, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to add some color on the uh, idea of replaceable components. Um, because I think that's very abstract, the way we talk about it for us. We've been thinking about this for quite some time, so we have an yeah. intuitive sort of understanding already of what we mean by this. Um, but imagine, like, in the current situation, you install you install C++ Nix, as we call it, and uh, on your machine, there's a store, there's a builder, there's a language evaluator, um, and there's some functionality for remote builds, but it's, it's not used by a lot of people, I think. Um, but it exists. And you are kind of tied to these components. Um, so what we envision is a world where you can uh, take one of these components, let's say the store, and instead of a local folder that's uh, located on your disk, you plug in something like an S3 bucket in that situation. In fact, our store supports some use cases that are very close to this already. Um, so we are kind of proving that this is possible to do in theory. Um, there's also uh, projects that are related to Nix, like the Geeks project, which uses uh, Scheme instead of Nix uh, definition language. Um, and it would, in theory be, theory, be possible for the Geeks people to write an, uh, an integration between their Scheme interpreter and uh, Twix so that they could use our builder infrastructure, our store infrastructure, and so on. On the builder side, you could imagine a situation like you would want to run builds on a distributed compute cluster. You have, let's say, a Kubernetes cluster with, with workers on there. And you just want to switch out the component that's scheduling the builds locally on your machine for something that runs the builds in a cluster somewhere far away and takes care of the orchestration there. And uh, for all of that, your local interfaces don't have to change if we correctly define the abstractions between these components. And that's yeah. what we're trying to do. This this uh, this is also for like this is for builders. This is for stores. You as a like each component doesn't need to be aware of the the bigger ecosystem that it is situated inside. Like you can have a, if you want to say you have a, um, uh, you have a store, uh, an implementation of a store that takes care of storing blobs and uh, the fact on whether you have, an, let's say a local LIU cache in front of that doesn't change um, 
the, the shape of the interface that the client is using. Like it knows I asked for a blob, I get this blob, and I can maybe put a blob and the blob is being put. It doesn't need to understand the, the mechanics of there being a, a cache in between or not. And it, so the idea is like you have a standardized interface um, and the logic that is using this interface doesn't need to be aware of the shape of, uh, of, uh, of, of the interface and what's coming there. Uh, so like substitution, for example, can be, um, can be described as a, as a composition of, uh, of, of multiple implementations of these, uh, of these store interfaces. Um, so why why did you start doing the rewrite in Rust? Um, I if, if I remember correctly, Floki, you've also written a Go implementation of the store layer. Uh, why Rust for of all things? Uh, I actually, uh, you want to start, Vincent, or should I? Yeah, I can. I mean, I can answer the Rust question because uh, the initial idea was not to rewrite everything in Rust. Um, the initial idea was to have the RPC interfaces defined between the components using protobuf uh, definitions, which work in basically any language. Um, and we specifically decided to write the language evaluator. So the thing that takes Nick's language code and, um, well, abstractly speaking, transforms it into build requests that we can send to the builder uh, in Rust, because it gives us low level control over memory. Language runtimes are quite complicated. Um, and that just seemed like the right fit also because it's a nice modern language and a lot of people in TBL, crucial point, are already familiar with Rust. Um, the initial plan was uh, to have the store, I believe, written in Go, and there were some experiments for it. Yeah. Um, this... Why that ended up being Rust instead, I think Florian is more qualified to answer. Yeah. So initially, I was not uh, too familiar with Rust. Uh, like I, I never say, like, I'll pick up this, this big project uh, to learn the language, but... Uh... So I, I was um, I was implementing some uh, some Go specific uh, code for Nix to understand the way like how output hashing works, how um, how things in the store are being stored, like all the interfaces for the binary cache protocol that you use when you when you download stuff from cachenix.org, the the the, the side of things you see when you need you request there. Like I implemented all of this in GoLang. I was like, mm, okay, I already kind of did half of that. Um, I started doing some experiments there. There's like a, a bunch of blog posts about this, and I was like, mm, I kind of need another protocol for this to make it more efficient, anyways. Um, we might as well just uh, just do it, that just do it do it right from the start and fix. I started writing most of the stuff in GoLang actually, and then grew tired of having to write uh, two implementations in two different languages, and my Rust skills did pick up since then. So I was like, okay, fuck it. Let's, uh, let's write it uh, in Rust as well. Let's port things over. And uh, I'm very happy uh, I, I did it because, yeah. Have, if, you, if, you, if you're prototyping something and if you're, you realize like, oh, hmm, it would be nice to slice this slightly different, uh, in Golang, you have to learn a lot of code and kind of write it again because it's very coding with crayons. And uh, in Rust, you it's it's a bit easier. Like you can keep most of the concepts around when you refactor uh, a certain data structure a bit. Um, in Golang, you have to, yeah, you usually have to write more stuff again over and over again because you can can't nicely abstract over a, over a concept in something. You can only, uh, yeah, yeah. You had to. I, I had to rewrite a lot of things like over and over again, and I was like, okay. Let's do this in Rust. Let's do it uh, properly. And we still have the bindings. We still have the library code that interacts with the um, with the data structures, with the RPC methods. You can still write uh, your own implementation of the store in, well, in any language. But specifically, it's easy to write it in GoLang because we still have the library code for that. In fact, there's already people who wrote uh, another implementation that's not living in the in the depot, but like. Uh, Brian did write a NATS implementation of uh, of some of the store components that is written in GoLang. Um, yeah, this is still possible. So it's a it's kind of a proof for the for the cross language compatibility of the different components and of the interfaces. But uh, it doesn't mean I I have to like like it was a it was a nicer choice to write it in Rust in the end um, than uh, than to keep it in GoLang. By the way, yeah. the depot is the name of our monorepo. So if we say something like that, uh, it's it's already TVL terminology. Being outside of the depot just means that it's not sort of an official TVL project. It's living not within our territory. 
your domain of responsibility. Exactly. Um, so you, you've been talking in terms of proof of concept or the, a vision or a world that you would like to live in. Uh, how much of that is already a reality? How far it has Twix gone and uh, how, what can you already do with it? Are you using it for something? Um, so we have a working language evaluator. You can actually play with it online. I think we'll put a link in the description later on. Um, so there's a version of it that runs fully in your browser. It supports the Nix language um, as, uh, as compatible with Nix 2.3. That means the language that is used in Nix packages. Um, and you can use it for a variety of stuff. I know of a couple of projects that are using it as a configuration language, which is an interesting use case that kind of came up along the way. So we didn't originally plan for that. It just, it, it just turned out to be possible. Um, the Nix language itself is kind of nice. If you think of it as JSON with functions, I think uh, Elko himself called it that at some point. Um, and if you're just wanting to generate some configuration with a relatively simple logic, it's quite nice to use the Nix language for that. So we have a Rust library you can include in a Rust project and it gives you uh, a SERDI, SERDI is a serialization library in Rust, a SERDI interface to Nix code. So you can literally pass it some string with Nix code and it deserializes cleanly into a Rust data structure. So you can have a config type and pin it to that. That's, I think, the main production use of the evaluator that exists right now. I'm aware of one company actually that's doing this in internal tooling. Um, and uh, you can use our web-based debugger uh, for the Nix language to see what's going on in the Twix evaluator, how evaluation works and so on, and, and play with it there. Um, for the evaluator side, that's the main thing right now. But the evaluator is basically working. We do have some work left to do. Um, I mean, there's always work left to do. A project is never really done, but uh, we're working on improving some of the fundamental runtime characteristics for things like very deep recursions and jumping around between executions of built-in functions in Nix, which are implemented natively in Rust and code written in Nix. Uh, it's all quite a complex area um, of research, almost, I would call it. Uh, but it's, it's, it's fun work there is ongoing. Um, for the store, I think Florian is more qualified. Yeah, I mean, store has, uh, like, um, store is going to get more backends. Like, uh, there's an in-memory implementation, or actually two in-memory implementation, one on disk implementation. Um, well, there is this, this glue code that, that can, can consume cache Nixos org or other binary caches and kind of natively bring them into uh, into the Twix store uh, hierarchy, like view it as a Twix store, kind of so to say. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, there's more there's more work to be done there. Like the whole composition stuff is something I still want to work on. More bridges, like more more glue code to interface with existing Nicks. For example, um, if we speak the Nix daemon protocol as uh, as annoying as it might be, and as, you might as, have to explain what that is. Yeah, yeah. Nix daemon protocol is like whenever you invoke a Nix build on your local Nix OS machine, um, then uh, your your local user Valentin is gonna is gonna talk to the Nix daemon that runs on the same system, and it's gonna like if you, you kind of send, hey, I would like to build this thing here, and then the the Nix daemon takes care of building uh, this thing and sends you back the. Well, it doesn't send you back the result, but it says like I finished building it. I put it in the store here, and uh, we could um, we could write some code that uh, talks the same interface. So you could be using uh, your existing Nix evaluator to um, to trigger builds with Twix, or the other way around. Like you could use the you could use the the Twix evaluator to um, to trigger builds on an existing. Uh, remote builder that uses Nix, like all these these kind of things. I mean, it's not necessarily very performant and useful in in practice to be um, like like long term production kind of use cases. But especially if we're talking about interoperability and uh, um, like testing things behave the same way, it's very important to have all this glue code. Um, so, yeah, I was, just about, so I was just about to ask, um, what, what are the differences to the upstream to the C++ Nix implementation? So you said performance, um, to what extent and uh, what else? Uh, does it, is it completely compatible, both the store and the language? The idea uh, the is that you can take, oh, yeah. No, the I would say the, the, the language packages. is fully compatible. Yeah, you can take Nix packages and uh, evaluate and ideally it's going to come up with the same build artifacts, with the same store paths. Can be uh, should still be able to to substitute from cache nixos org, um, 
It's just using, like the store, for example, uses another internal model internally. It can still synthesize the view that Nix uses. Like it can still render NAR files, for example, uh, for hashing purposes, for in, for like having to communicate this NAR to someone else purposes. But it's not using NARS as its internal data structure under the hood. Um, so we can we can provide Nix compatible lenses. Into into the different uh, in, into the system, um, but we're not we're not required to implement the concepts the same. We try to stay compatible on the surface, but we might decide to do things differently under the hood. Um, and all the glue code and all the compatibility code that we write, we intend to make it uh, to, to move that logic out of the core Twix crates into an XCompat crate. So if you're writing your own piece of code that wants to assemble NAR files for whatever other reasons, you can use this library code without having to pull in all of Twix, um, which also helps for like if, yeah, if someone wants to write some code, produce some Nix uh, specific data structures, formats, whatever, or parse them, uh, you can, we have an A term parser, we have an R parser, we have an R uh, renderer, the same stuff for NAR info. There's like, there's like a lot of code there and we intend to, to, to add more there to, to do all the interoperability stuff. In general, um, I think we we have some thoughts about what constitutes the actual API surface of Nix. Like as a user, what is the thing that you really care about? And my personal view is that it's not so much like what uh, options in the CLI named, for example. Um, there's an, some API surface there insofar as Nix OS invokes some Nix commands during its rebuilds and so on, which of course we want to support through a compatibility layer. but the main API surface that we see for Nix is currently the language. It's like what exists in Nix packages, essentially. Um, and there we intend to be fully compatible. Uh, we do have some differences in our evaluation model. So in Nix, I mentioned some phase separation earlier. What I mean by that is on a very high level, Nix first tries to figure out everything that it has to build, essentially, to, to get to a target that was requested by a user. And then it starts doing all the builds. In practice, it's slightly different because of IFD, but that's like the overall idea. Whereas we are aiming for a model where as we are evaluating code in the language, whenever we detect something that needs to be built, we already start building. So we get a kind of slightly more parallel implementation that can like fork out, get a bunch of builds done and like merge again, continue some language evaluation. Um, so the API surface and level of the language and so on doesn't change, but we do have a different model under the hood, I would say. Also for the store, I wanted to add, Floki, I think maybe you want to tell us about the Fuse support and some of the cool stuff that we can do with that because that's already working and quite. Yeah, simple. we have a, we have a, um, because, because, uh, yeah, because the store uses an internal, internally a different data structure, like it doesn't, like it doesn't populate a slash nix slash store directory with a bunch of files and directories, but it keeps this internally as its data structure. And one way to view this is um, is taking taking a look at the, the Nix binary cache protocol. Like you can you can spin up a, a binary cache in interface that gives you an HTTP interface that shows you our infos and our files, but you can also see it as a file system. And we have a Fuse uh, and a Vita OFS um, view into the system. So you can say like, I would like to spin up this, I would like to mount my Twix store at a certain uh, at a certain location. Or I would like to, well, with IOFS gives you a Unix socket and then you spin up a VM and then you tell this VM, mount, uh, like, like make this available here, but it's kind of the same thing. You can, you can mount, uh, you can mount a Twix store into a specific place, um, which, uh, yeah, which allows you to, uh, not have to render this on disk at all and not even have to fetch it on this to, to disk at all if you don't need it. For example, if you're in a remote build scenario and you're gonna say like, oh, I wanna, I wanna build this thing on this other box somewhere in the data center and you have like two gigabytes of source code that normally you would need to copy over there all the time. If you're using the, the Twix model, you could kind of lazily, um, you can already start the build and as long as the, the build uh, process itself doesn't access that source code, uh, you don't need to copy it over the wire in the first place. Um, yeah, which, which unlocks some nice properties where we can, you can boot a micro VM that hasn't, doesn't have any disk um, straight from a binary cache. 
uh, and and have it do stuff and then have it shut itself down again without ever having to write to slash nix slash store on, on the host without even having to have nix installed or or Twix installed globally on that host. There's like a lot of interesting um, ecosystems where you then can suddenly start to run these things that previously couldn't because they, they cannot use slash nix slash store on the host. For example, like in HPC workloads, like they have these strict requirements of like everything has to build in a certain path that is specific to our organization and our structure. And uh, with Twix, you could say like, yeah, well, we just have a data deal here and the VMs that we spin up, they they see a slash nix slash store, but it's it's purely virtual. It's, it doesn't really exist on uh, on disk. Maybe for clarification with C++ nix, essentially everything has to live on the file system on disk right now. Yes. Right? So you cannot just project things out of the blue into the... No. Uh, okay, we have an audience question here. Thank you very much. Sarah is asking, uh, you've talked about separate components, a store, evaluator, and so forth, but have you also used Twix as a library? Nix adjacent tools today shell out to Nix and Sentiate a lot, which sucks and is slow. Yeah, so for the language um, part, you can literally include Twix eval, which is the language evaluation as a Rust crate. Uh, and there's a we actually did spend some time designing a nice library interface there, so you can totally use the evaluator to, to do basically whatever you want. Um, I don't know about the store interface on the Rust side. So you want to be using Twix, to yeah. You want to be using Twix glue these days, uh, which mm -hmm. gives you a, um, so like the evaluator itself, it doesn't really know about how IO works, how to talk to a store or how to trigger builds. It only knows about how Nix, the language itself works. Um, and some of the built-ins that do store interaction or like some of the, the implementations that describe how to do IO are like, uh, are like living in this Twix glue thing. So Twix glue now has the, the code to instantiate a, a more, more common Nix evaluator that knows how to deal with, uh, with like store interaction and knows what built-ins dot derivation is. Um, so yes, you can, uh, you can totally use that as a library. You don't have to, you don't have to use our CLI for this. You can write your own library uh, that uh, you can write your own code that uses Twix glue and transitively uses the other things to um, to to make all this happen. So there's it's also perfect. public documentation for this available at docs.twix.dev where you can see the uh, interface of our crates. Yeah. So it's not just the store that is highly modular, it's also the language evaluator. Can you like puzzle yes. it together with your own built-ins and such? You can bring yeah. your own built-ins. So uh, all of what you're, you've been describing looks very much like hardcore software developer stuff. So it's like a bunch of bunch of building blocks that you can fit together as uh, as, as, as you as you wish. Uh, what about end users? Is that like can regular computer users to uh, that want to um, have some some package run on their system use Twix now? Um, probably not in the way that. Uh, you're thinking like you can't currently replace the Nix on your system with Twix. Um, we do have a plan to do that eventually for Nix OS users. Uh, so there will be a compatible CLI which supports all the same invocations and so on. Uh, but right now it's definitely, as you said, more focused towards developers, both because some of the integration cases we have are, well, exactly this case of people pulling parts of Twix out as a library and using them for some kind of tool. Um, or, well, we, the people who are working on Twix, uh, who are not yet interested from our perspective in that kind of uh, higher level interface, let's call it that. Um, that will come eventually, but we're currently more focused on the underlying stuff there. Uh, also, as soon as we start doing that, we open sort of the Pandora's box of what does the CLI look like? Um, which also in the Nix community traditionally has been a controversial question with two different CLIs existing. Um, so we'll, we'll take that when we need to take it right now. It's not urgent for us. Um, if somebody has a specific thing in mind for which they would like to use Nix, um, uh, sorry, Twix, you can come to us. We'll help you out. Uh, the, the channel is open to everyone. Um, but right now, if you just want to drop in Twix in your system, you will have to wait a little more. Uh, how do you use it? You use it then. Are you running Nix OS with like your own Twix wrappers? Uh, we do have uh, VM tests and so on. So we are basically running Twix VMs um, as part of the CI process. But uh, we, well, I am not running Twix as the main Nix on my system yet, if that's what you're asking. It's mostly because we don't have a builder component yet. 
uh, which is the thing that actually invokes the builds and populates the store. Um, that's sort of the last bit of glue needed there. As long uh, as soon as that's in place, we can probably make that work fairly fast. Um, and that work is actively happening right now. Um, literally a couple of hours ago, Florian and I had a meeting about uh, the current state of Builder. So things are moving there. Okay, so what do you see? What do you see for the future, Florian? Where uh, where will Twix go? Will it be the default Nix eventually? What do you think? Um, this is something like like is the community going to be using this or is it going to be using the other thing? Like I don't know what the community is going to move to, but um, I definitely want Twix to be a a nice alternative for people to use. A nice uh, a nice especially for the, all the use cases where we would like to be using uh, Nix as a library, but we cannot because it's it's not really meant to be. I mean, I know people people are working on getting some FFI bindings to some C parts in the evaluator and stuff, but it's all a bit, it's all a bit meh. Um, uh, there's there's like Hydra, for example, where, where which has its kind of its own evaluator that tries to statically determine the list of things to build by using parts of the, the Nix evaluator, by using parts of its own evaluator, and then schedules build on its own. Like I think one use case where we don't need to work too much on um, on like how is the CLI gonna look like could be an, an ICI system, especially with the with the store and the builder being a bit more granular and uh, and and less copying back and forth heavy, this could be this could be much faster and nicer. So I think the next step, once we have a builder, could be to move our own CI um, to use this as a builder and as an evaluator. To uh, yeah, like to like people say, drink your own wine or eat your own dog food, however you call it. But um, yeah, try to really make this thing useful in a in a context with a lot of uh, derivations to be built. Um, I think that's one of the next steps. I think once we get to that step, we'll need somebody who knows anything about front end so that we can make a nice interface for whatever CI we come up with. Because I think based on what we've been telling you, you can imagine what kind of interfaces we design when we need to make something visual. Uh, speaking about CI, uh, what, what is it that you're using for your monorepo setup? I suppose it has to be quite massive. Um, so we have something like 650, 700 maybe build targets at this point. Um, it's lots of random projects. so. Many of the people in TVL put their personal NixOS configs in the repo, for example. Now our CI builds everybody's personal NixOS machines. There's lots of hobby projects, IOC bots, websites, all this kind of stuff. Keyboard um, firmwares. Key keyboard firmwares, which needs cross-compiled bootstrapping of GCC, all sorts of crazy stuff is in there, basically. Um, we are using BuildKite at the moment. Um, so BuildKite is... Uh, well, it's basically like a hosted CI thing. They have a coordination service. You run the runners. Um, and they, a while ago, or years ago at this point, they agreed to give us free access to this because we are an open source project. Um, and we have, on our end, uh, written a lot of tooling that's implemented in plain Nix, which essentially assembles a kind of Nix data structure out of our monorepo that represents all of the build targets in the repo. And then we have a translation layer from that into uh, the format expected by BuildKite, which, by the way, happens dynamically. So when you when you make a change in our repo, um, the Nix evaluator figures out which things were actually affected by your change. So let's say you change a library used by several different components, they will all rebuild. Um, and then we only, we only run the builds for the components that have actually changed. Um, in theory, the structure is designed such that you can plug in a different output there so you can traverse this tree that we have which is already assembled into like a ready structure and instead of outputting the specific yaml files basically that build kite consumes you can output i don't know gitlab ci files or whatever you want uh, it's just so we don't use anything else so we haven't done that yet um what's likely to happen in what flockley talked about is that we will just drop build kite at that point um and kind of just run the Nix builds ourselves. Uh, all of the all of the things that happen are Nix builds, with some very minor exceptions of like code formatters running as a shell script and so on. Um, and once that happens, we will just have that happening in our orchestration system, for which we do not have an interface. So uh, we lose the, the the beautiful interactive web UI that we have right now. But um, it'll be more dog foody for sure. 
Um, so how can one be part of it? How, how to help with making more of Twix a reality and possibly helping with integrating it into a package that actual people apart from hardcore developers can use? Um, so there's multiple ways of doing this. I think the most common way is that you just join the community. So kind of you start hanging out in our chat channel, see what's going on, see what topics we're discussing, um, what's happening in the issue tracker and so on, and pick something that you'd like to work on. Um, all the people who wrote all of this stuff are in that channel. So it's the best way to, to get help. We do also have cases of people that show up out of nowhere and send us like, we've no idea who they are. They show up, they send us a patch that like fully implements some kind of feature and then they disappear forever. Um, we like that. So you can do that too. And feel free if you figure it out all on your own. Um, we're happy to accept random patches from random people. But the more common ways, I think, to join the community, figure out what we're working on at the moment, and then like figure out what you can do from there. There's a lot of work in many different areas open. Anything from um, like hardcore, if you will, implement like implementation details of language evaluation to um, scheduling of builds in distributed environments, front end stuff, whatever you want. There's, there's some task for you if you're interested. It would be helpful if you are planning to work on a feature that you reach out first in one capacity or the other, because we might have some sort of idea on how we would like to do these, and these might not fully be, be written out anywhere. Like a lot of this stuff still, unfortunately, is just in some of our heads. Um, and uh, yeah, it would it would make it easier to 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 ensure early on that that you have the same mental model of how this should be implemented in, in, in one way or another, at least for some of the concepts like for for how we do the um, the builds um, and and how we how we drive the evaluator and how we consider the evaluator to be a long term running thing that uh, that that emits builds and then continues as the build has been finished. Like this is a this is a different uh, this is a different setup from how Nix does it, which might not be intuitive, and uh, I'm not sure we documented all this yet. So yeah, we also need to write more text. I think. <laughs> So I suppose you want to help uh, write more text, right? Yeah. Um, so I, ju I just read out a few uh, audience questions that kind mm -hmm. of piled up, but they, they were not actual questions. So here's um, uh, the distributed store could solve so many HPC style setups nicely. So um, you mentioned HPC, so I can imagine there's definitely relevant for that. And about the Go implementation, just the error handling in Rust made me choose it over Golang. Um, there's also uh, on, on the CLI, I've heard that the Consolidated Geek CLI is loved a bit more than the Nick CLI may be, might be worth a look for inspiration at least. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I suppose since you said that um, you're writing, uh, you're, you're using Nix to, to get everything together and uh, even your personal stuff uh, that you put into the monorepo, but there's quite some crazy, crazy things in there have accumulated over time, right? Yeah, um, while so especially when it comes to the language, while we were figuring out how the next language works, <laughs> we discovered, let's say, uh, in our process of archaeology, a bunch of things that Nix can do that nobody was really familiar with before, because they were like implementation details of the parser, for example. Um, and TVL is full of very crazy projects where somebody like found one of those features and then like wrote something with it. We have we discussed this before we have an implementation of an html rendering engine in nix and we also have a, a working web framework written in the nix language um, that if you see it is probably quite unusual i don't know if i can show something sure. in this stream if that's, i'll just try to do that quickly i, I can share a specific tab perfect uh, let me try and find um this code that we have is this visible? No, it is. Okay, to perfect. crank up your uh, font size. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that in a second. So we have a we have a contributor, Sterni, also known as Stern Simmann, who's very active in the Nix community. And he had this idea to write um, using the angle brackets in Nix, which we found out while reading the C++ Nix parser, which we found out you can override a, a Nix HTML rendering framework, which looks like this. Uh, so this is to, literal. I think you have to make it larger still. So. I'll yep. try and make it even larger. It's just got a lot of UI stuff around here. Uh, wait. You can collapse ah. the sidebar. There's this. Uh, yeah. Yes. Maybe that's. Is that readable? Do we need more? <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, so you see these these are not strings. These are literally the same things in which you would write like angle brackets next packages. It's just that we found a way to override what they're doing. So you can write HTML elements by using these angle brackets and then adding attributes in normal uh, attribute sets after them. Um, so, so stuff like this just continuously pops up in, in, in the TVL repo. Um, if you look at our code review system, there's a tag on some CLs, which is what we call commits, which is a hashtag cursed. And under hashtag cursed, you can find a lot of crazy stuff like this, which we've accumulated over the years. Um, yeah, so that's, that's one example of that. <laughs> So the other thing is actually a web server that like does uh, yeah, side effects. A, and, and <laughs> which which also was written by Sterni, and I believe it was published on April 1st last year. Um, it's called Web Bubblegum, and it lets you write, I think, CGI applications in Nix. Uh, so that you can actually have the Nix language serve your backend requests if that, for some reason, is something you would want to do. OK, uh, I, we're slowly coming to an end since, since time is running out. Everyone in the live audience, uh, please send us more questions. They are awesome. Uh, you're an infinite source of creativity there. Um, for, from my side, I wonder, so what uh, what could the role of Twix and Twix community be inside the larger, or at some point, possibly as large, Nix community? Um, where what's 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 a possible future of possible maybe integrating uh, parts of what you've done into upstream next plus c plus plus yeah in theory that's possible that there's some licensing questions around that um which have come up before because twix is licensed under the gpl and um i think for a lot of us that's actually very intentional like we know what the gpl means and we do want the guarantees that it gives um but there's probably ways to to figure that out in the future uh, one role that I see more on the, if you will, on the political side of the Nix community um, is that I would like there to be a future where two different implementations of the language are heavily used and have people depending on them um, because it makes it harder for either side to just randomly make changes to the language, for example, which break compatibility. Um, that's something that's occasionally happening and we'd like to have uh, some slightly better coordination process for that, um, let's say. And that's that's sort of a non-technical thing, if you will. Um, but I think it's also an important aspect of, of what we're doing by having a sort of diversity of implementations. Why, um, why by the way, matter that no, um, sorry, no, please continue. Yeah, I just wanted to add, actually, Twix is, as far as I'm aware, aware the third complete implementation of the Nix language. Um, there's another one uh, called HNix written in Haskell. Um, and HNIX is, as far as I know, also capable of evaluating Nix packages, but it's more of a research project um, in typical Haskell fashion. It wasn't really intended to replace Nix, I think. It was more of like, how can we write this uh, for fun? And I remember using HNIX at some point to try and extract comments out of a Nix AST when I wrote Nix doc, which is uh, one of the things that generates documentation for the official Nix packages manuals. Um, and I was like, hey, how do I traverse your AST to get documentation comments? They were like, well, a good place to start is reading this mathematical paper about recursion schemes. And I'm like, well, OK, I see this is a slightly different kind of use case than what I have. Uh, but yeah, in theory, there's already three implementations of the language. And um, we have some goals like having a common language conformance test suite. We took the tests from C++ next. Actually, actually we're running them. Um, we have a lot of our own tests about like strange scoping edge cases and so on. And it would be nice if there was like a common language test suite. A lot of languages that have multiple implementations have something like this. And it kind of like helps uh, kind of draw delineation and understand of where, what is the Nix language other than the code, the specific code that implements it. Uh, so I was I was wondering why why does it matter that the language is that stable? Why wouldn't it be very hard if you have three language implementation with different group, different groups of people that have to coordinate it just to add I don't know a build in to process some strings? Um, there's a lot of different cases in which Nix packages is used. So I'm mostly concerned with Nix packages. I don't really care that much what people do in their personal configuration. I'm also uh, I'm actually not putting TVL's configuration on a higher pedestal here. Like we know that we are breaking some of the Nix code, the crazy Nix code we have in TVL by uh, sticking to like the fully Nix packages compatible way of doing things. Um, but I think that Nix packages, one of the nice guarantees about it is that you can go back in time. 
Um, you can bisect across large versions of, of uh, Nix packages history. You can figure out what particular strange little third party library introduced a bug that you started seeing in your environment. And if across these different commits of Nix packages, you start having uh, instabilities because of random changes in the language, it becomes a lot more difficult uh, to do this kind of archaeology work, if you will. Um, so Nix would be we're not we're creating different uh, build recipes for that um, for that piece of code if the behavior would change and then you would end up with different output paths and you would not be able to use the cache artifacts it would be an entirely different build and you yeah. want to keep this constant we're also not saying that the language should never change or no built-ins should ever be added or anything like that it's more like if a built-in should be added it should already be added with something like a, a polyfill that makes sure that the compatibility keeps working with with older evaluators with newer evaluators and all of this kind of stuff um, and also of course implementations are free to add their own features which are not related to nix packages right so like we in twix we could add uh like we could add a built-in dot fetch tvl target which like automatically fetches something from our monorepo right which is definitely not part of the official nix language and will never be in nix packages but it's something we could support Likewise, C++ Nix has the experimental flakes feature, which we don't plan to support, which isn't used in Nix packages. Um, so implementations can still do their own stuff. But what we're really saying is Nix packages is important. There's a lot of work that goes into Nix packages. We want that thing to be stable and reliable and use some sort of agreed upon subset, if you will, of all possible versions of the Nix language. Um, okay, so um, what we're we're coming to an end. I um, I wonder what is what's there next? What's to expect from TVL? You talked a little bit about the ideas that you have for the future stuff that you want to work on, such as a CLI on demand when when that becomes uh, relevant. Uh, what's what's uh, what's cooking behind the scenes? What do you have planned for the next couple of years? Um, yeah, Florian just received a new uh, grant for further development of some of the Twix components. Maybe you want to tell us what's in that grant. Like, what are you going to be focusing on? Um, it's it's going to be uh, builder and store focused, so likely more store um, more store backends, uh, flash it, fully fleshing out the whole interaction between the builders and and Nix. Like we have some skeleton code, but it's 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 it probably needs more work. More uh, test suites to um, to like test different combinations of different store backends. So the idea is like you could you could be writing your own store backend that store things on I don't know like metadata in a Postgres database, and then you want to uh, to ensure that uh, this thing behaves the same way as Twix expects other store backends to behave, and then you could plug it into a test suite. Uh, this is the kind of thing I uh, I'm, I'm currently mostly focusing on. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll end the show today. Um, thank you a lot for being here. That was very informative. I hope our audience learned a little bit of what's what's up with Nix, literally. Uh, the next show will be already tomorrow on Friday, December 1st at 10.30 UTC, where we will meet Theo van Uschmidt and uh, Matthias Meschede and talk about commercial use of Nix. Let's meet next time uh, and the, at the 2023 Next Developer Dialogues. Thanks for watching and see you. Bye-bye. Thank you.